Thank you for watching DC Statehood Today, the show that keeps you informed on the latest DC Statehood issues. I'm your host, Denisha Richard. You can watch us online at dctv.org or dc51.us. You can also follow us on Twitter at dc51today. Support for the D.C. statehood is at a record high, according to a recent Washington Post poll. 67% of D.C. residents say they would support statehood for the district. 7 in 10 district residents also say that Congress holds excessive power in D.C. Congress currently has full jurisdiction over local district laws, including legislation regarding gun control and family planning. The article quotes D.C.'s fight for statehood as one of the weirdest situations in the world. Senator Paul Strauss visited Hollywood, California as a sponsor of the Creative Coalition 51st State Holiday Dinner. Senator Strauss joined celebrities from the television and movie industry to spread the message of statehood. Celebrities that joined the dinner included Tashina Arnold, Quentin Aaron, and Blair Redford. The event is one of the many outreach events planned by the D.C. statehood congressional delegation. Two votes prevented the passage of a resolution supporting D.C. statehood at the National Conference of State Legislators. D.C. Councilmember Nadeau introduced the resolution, which would respectfully urge the Congress of the United States to support legislation that would provide the residents of the District of Columbia with the same residents to govern, as enjoyed by all other residents of America. The resolution needed 21 votes to pass and only gained 19. HR 317 has gained several new co-sponsors, Representative Langevin, Representative Nolan, and Representative Price recently pledged their support to the bill, introduced by Eleanor Holmes Norton, to admit the district as a 51st state in the union. The total number of co-sponsors is now at 128. The number of co-sponsors for the Senate bill is 19. The District of Columbia is now a member of the UNPO, also known as the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. The organization's mission is to protect human and civil rights for unrecognized or occupied territories. Membership into the organization is strict, and D.C. was the only territory accepted out of three applicants. The UNPO recently visited the district from Brussels, Belgium to raise awareness of the oppression of the Baloch people in Iran and Pakistan and to advocate for D.C. statehood. Next, stay tuned to learn more about the UNPO and its mission. Thank you for watching DC Statehood today. My name is Denisha Richard. Joining us, we have a very special guest joining us from all the way in Brussels, Belgium. Here with us, we have Mr. Nazir Bolade. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. I'm doing very well. And he is the president of the UNPO, also known as the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. So let's just talk a little bit about your organization and its history and the mission and some of the members that are a part of the organization. Thank you very much. First of all, I want, uh, would like to thank you and I'm happy to be here in Washington. Uh, UNPO is a organi member organization. We have membership from uh, different continents and now also from the North America, DC. Uh, we have representing different people, they have different objectives, uh, but all of them think that they are in somehow, some way being discriminated and does not having their full right as a human being. Well, thank you for that. Now, also, there are very strict requirements into becoming a member of the UNPO. What are some of those requirements? Well, the requirements differ from different group of people. As I said, there are uh, differentiation of the people also at different uh, kind of situation that they, 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 are, they are. For instance, Taiwan is a country that doesn't have representation in the United Nations. And the DC has applied, it doesn't have full uh, representation and full right within the system of the United States of America. Uh, so there are people like uh, Baluchistan that I represent uh, at the UNPO. We are uh, looking for our self-determination within Iran in a federal system or for sovereignty of the Baluch people. So we all have our different objectives. But one thing that we share, uh, we have some demand from the state or from the international community. Now we all know that the UNPO does have an international community. And specific to the Washington DC area, what went into the decision into granting membership to the UNPO? Uh, uh, DC, as a, uh, 
member of the United States does not enjoy the same membership right that other states enjoy in the uh, United States and in the Senate and in the Congress. Uh, their representative does not have the, fa the same uh, voting rights. When people vote somebody to the office, they expect him to do something and to defend them in the United States uh, Congress and the House of Representatives, but they do not have this uh, possibility. And that's why we think that uh, as the paying, uh, they pay taxes so as the other member or other citizen of the United States of America, they should have the same right. And that was some of the criteria that UNPO has accept as a membership of the DC. And we hope uh, DC one day become a full member, sh member and uh, with the full right as other state in the uh, representative house of the United States of America. Now I'm very sure that the UNPO will give great assistance to the District of Columbia. What are some of the ways that the UNPO helps its other members of the organization? Well, the uh, UNPO, for instance, for the, uh, for the uh, DC is that, that uh, it's, it's create an understanding because no, uh, not so many in the world understand why the DC is, uh, doesn't have the full membership. And some other countries like uh, ours, and uh, they have been uh, uh, get, uh, giving some kind of attention in internationally, having been uh, possible for them to talk their situation with the United Nations and other uh, democratic institutions. They have been member of the UNPO before, like Latvia, like uh, Timor. Uh, which have been member of the UNPO when they have been asking for their self-determination and full right in the international community. Now they are member of the United Nations and also some are member in the European community in the uh, EU. So there, is, there are different ways that the UNPO can assist those people to trying to get their right as a people and as a, for their self-determination. And you came all the way here to the Washington DC area to you know, bring up issues that are happening around the world. Now, what brings your, what is your exact reason for visiting the Washington DC area? Well, uh, uh, my plan visit uh, for the Washington DC was in opportune time because I was planning this before to come here as a representative of the uh, Baluch people to come here and to talk about situation for the Baluchistan, which is divided between Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. We face uh, massive and persistent human rights violations. This is not the same thing that you have in the DC, but there's a difference there. But uh, the, we share the common interest to, to make sure that because when people are asking for their right, uh, they are not in different, uh, they could be in different situations, but everybody has right to be a full member of its country anyway. So uh, there are, we are trying to uh, get the attention of the you know, US government and the uh, uh, House of Representatives to say that in the Middle East there are different kinds of conflict. There is not only one conflict like Shi and Sunni. Uh, we have people like Baluch. In, uh, the, in that region, like uh, the Arabs also, or uh, Persian, or uh, Kurds, and particularly the oppressed nationality like Baluch and Kurd in that region. Mm -hmm. So you are here on business, making things happen, but how have you enjoyed the fun side of Washington, D.C.? Well, I always enjoy being in Washington. It's not my first time. I uh, take a walk around Washington, and I've been here so many times. Uh, different uh, places in the Washington. I, uh, being, uh, all, uh, I, I like it to be here sometimes. So I come here once, twice, or three times a year. Wonderful. Well, thank you for coming all the way to the Washington, D.C. area. Thank you, and we welcome you here, President Bolade. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank you all of you, and especially Mr. Paul Strauss that has uh, made this all possible for us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for joining us, and thank you for watching D.C. Statehood today. Hello, I'm Theodora Brown, your host for today's segment of the DC Statehood Today Show. And with me today we have in our studio Jim McGrath, who is the chairman and founder of the DC Tenants Advocacy Coalition. Welcome, Jim McGrath. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great. So tell us how what motivated you to establish this organization. Well, first of all, uh, I am a frustrated social worker as well as a political junkie and I have ever since I was a kid cared an awful lot about the poor because we were poor, we grew up poor and we live in a poor neighborhood and I hobnob with poor kids. Who Where'd you grow up? 
I grew up in Roxbury, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which was the poorest part of Boston, mm -hmm. and I saw a lot of poverty there. And I saw a lot of uh, people living in public housing. We lived in public housing, and we had very little money, very little resources growing up. And I kind of learned social work uh, by indirection, and I liked the idea a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So I studied it, uh, and I decided to teach school, but I gave that idea up and became a political junkie instead. Okay. <laughs> and so what brought you to D.C. then? Well, I soon recognized while I was in the Army that if you're a political junkie, Washington, D.C., is the political capital of the world. And since I had ambitions to uh, delve into politics at all levels, I figured Washington is the place to be, and I was right. It was the place to be. Right. So when did, you, when did you start the D.C. Tenants Advocacy Coalition? TENAC is now pushing 25 years old, and I and two other wonderful people, Laura Shell, an African-American woman, and Farouk, Farouk Youssef, an, an Egyptian uh, gentleman, the three of us founded TENAC. And the DC Tenants Advocacy Coalition is universally known as TENAC, T-E-N-A-C. Uh, it has a three-part mission. We lobby for rent control, affordable housing, and tenants' rights. And so that, that's interesting. So what's the connection with DC statehood? Well, you know, tenants' rights and political rights are flip sides to the same coin. Mm -hmm. And we realize that a disenfranchised city disenfranchises everyone. Uh, everyone across the board gets considerably lost in the shuffle when a city has so little representation. Uh, now, Eleanor Holmes Norton is our non-voting delegate to Congress. Yes. Republicans ruthlessly stripped her of her vote, and she is my personal hero. As a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, I sat in front of the Safeway store in Northwest Washington and got her 150 signatures to put her on the ballot. She needs 2,000. But for me alone, to get that many wasn't bad. Wasn't bad. Right, right. right. So, and so the connection with statehood and tenants' rights and 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 states' rights, or it's not states' rights really. It's just really rights for citizens of D.C. Yes. Right. Yes. And the other thing is, when I first came here, I also got a job on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. and I worked for the House Judiciary Committee during the years when the uh, Civil Rights Bill of 1964 and the Voting Rights Bill of 1965 were passed. And I sat in the gallery and I watched passage of both of those bills in the House. And that was not an easy time. It was a tough time to get that legislation passed, but with the combination of Lyndon Johnson, the aftermath of the Kennedy assassinations, and a legendary chairman, Emanuel Seller of New York, they passed those two landmark bills, and that was the beginning of a civil rights revolution, not only in Washington, but all across the country. All right. And other than supporting um, our delegate, what, what are the ways that, that tenants' rights and, 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 and D.C. statehood intersect for your organization? Well, we view Mrs. Norton as the greatest friend of tenants in the city. She's been with us on every single uh, measure to improve affordable housing, rent control, and tenants' rights. And she has influence all across the board with the council, with the mayor, uh, with the ANCs, and everybody else. And we tie into that. Uh, and we strongly urge uh, a push right now for Latino benefits because in so many ways not only are the Latinos under attack, but they are a seriously disadvantaged population in the city. There's a lot of evictions affecting Latinos, there's a lot of poverty affecting them, uh, there's a lot of rent gouging affecting them, and so we want to reach out especially to the Latino population of the city, and I already have. I testify on before the council all the time, and I never fail to mention Latino situation. They need tenant associations, they need help in their homelessness. I've argued in the landlord tenant of court for evicted Latino tenants, you know, 
and I had a Spanish speaking, partly Spanish speaking judge who never stopped telling me to cierre la boca all the time. What does that mean? And, and all the rest, shut your mouth <laughs> because I'm not a lawyer and you have very limited rights to speak in the court if you're not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I spoke anyway as best mm -hmm. I could. Mm -hmm. So, so have you been following the Mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser's um, budgetary um, meetings that she's been having and, and sort of the focus that she has on, on ho affordable housing for DC? What, what's, your, what's, your, what's your thinking about that? I have very closely, my take on that as I say all the time is we hear an awful lot about affordable housing in the city, but there is no affordable housing in the city. The city has become terribly overpriced and unreachable for people. Now, we are doing something very s special now. We are organizing a major demonstration against Donald Trump at his Trump Plaza downtown because of his attack on Latinos and women and Muslims and disabled. And we're inviting the Latino group to join us down there. We have a grant for that purpose, and we will share it with the Latino community and the other communities, and we're inviting them to come down and join us. And we've had some trial runs down there. They've been very successful, and I think that they would find it very much in their interest to do that. So I'm hoping for that to happen. Well, it sounds like you're doing some wonderful and important, real, real important and relevant work in the District of Columbia, and especially as it relates to tenants and in the whole statehood um, intersection as well. Well, we try all the time, and some of them we win, some of them we don't, but we never stop. Getting. Keep on trying. There you go. Great. Thank you for joining us today for this segment of the D.C. Statehood Today show, and thank you again to our guest, Jim McGrath, Great <coughs> pleasure. who is the founder and chairman of the Tenants Advocacy Coalition, better known as TNAC. Uh, please join us for future segments of the D.C. Statehood Today show. Until then, be well. Hello, I'm Theodora Brown, and welcome to this segment of the DC Statehood Today show. Today we have in our studio our guest, David Schwartzman. Hello, David. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. And welcome, welcome. So I wanted to, want to sort of jump right in and start asking you questions. Uh, what brought you to Washington, DC, David? Uh, well, I got a job uh, as uh, teaching at Howard University mm -hmm. in 1973, and I first moved in actually to Arlington and then moved to DC in 1976 and I've been a resident ever since. Great. And so is there something significant that you did once you moved into the District of Columbia? Uh, well, uh, to me what was significant, <laughs> I joined the Statehood Party which in 1999 uh, merged with the small DC Green Party and now it's the DC Statehood Green Party which is one of now three uh, parties with ballot status in DC. Okay, so let's just go back yeah. to the to the folk who you met when you first came to DC in 1976 and joined the Statehood Party. Who were some of the other participants in the movement then? Oh yes, well you know Hilda Mason of course had was uh, a uh, Statehood Party uh, representative on the council at large. Uh, of course I remember Joe Butler uh, who ran actually in the, in 76 for a second seat, but she was denied. That's a long story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, I remember Sam Smith, mm -hmm. uh, Lou Aronica, a uh, whole bunch, of course, uh, um, uh, Gail Dixon, a whole bunch of founders of the State of Party. And of course, I never met uh, Julius Hobson Sr. Uh, but he was certainly, uh, you know, uh, the founder, really, of the State of Party. So the State of Party had a lot of traction in terms of D.C. politics um, 40 years ago. So tell us what's going on with the State of Party today. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we have not had uh, a council seat since Hilda left. Uh, I think was defeated in, in 98. Uh, and uh, but we are persevering. We have a lot of young people joining our party now. 
we have a steering committee a five member steering committee all under 30 by the way mm -hmm. and one of the members is Eugene Perrier who ran for council at large and did quite well for the first time and we are quite optimistic that we will uh, again get representation on the council uh, we are really the only party that has been challenging uh, a lot of the policies of the council in regard to, uh, let's say, well, let me be blunt, favoring the very wealthy at the expense of a lot of our residents. And I can go into some of the trends that we have been trying to mm -hmm. reverse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you see a connection between income inequality and, and, and the move for statehood for the District of Columbia? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way I looked at it and, and argued is that uh, the home rule is a shackle. It's a colonial shackle on us because we don't have our full rights. We all know that. Uh, but in order to break a shackle, we have to push against it and and break it apart. And the way and w the analogy there is mm -hmm. that we need to push the limits of home rule. And that would mean uh, doing better for a majority of our residents who are really, uh, the majority of DC mm -hmm. residents do not have affordable housing. If we go by the HUD uh, criteria, 30% of income, it right. shouldn't be no more than 30% of income. We have uh, the highest income inequality compared to the 50 states. We have a shockingly high mm -hmm. child poverty rate. Mm -hmm. And all of this could be addressed mm -hmm. even without statehood, but the fact that our council and elected government has not tapped, uh, for instance, our tax base sufficiently to address the needs, the real needs of low income residents, even middle income residents, mm -hmm. has disempowered our residents. And so I, I would say that, uh, and I would reflect on a poll that was done by the Washington Post in November, last November, uh, two thirds of the res residents mm -hmm. are favored statehood, but if we go to lower income folk, it's only half. And I think there's a bit of cynicism because people, and I've spoken to people mm -hmm. in canvassing and so on, and they feel, well, why should we become a state? We'll have the same crooked politicians as we have now, and I'm not generalizing, mm -hmm. of course, sure. they're all politicians. Sure. So, 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 so how, do you, how do you keep the, 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 pop, the populace engaged when you have people you know, harboring that kind of cynicism about you know, the fact that we're not a state and we probably shouldn't become a state because of what people are experiencing in, in terms of the corruption that we've experienced on the city council as well? Well, I think it's, uh, the key is uh, or organizing. Okay. Uh, there are a number of groups mm -hmm. I belong to, matter of mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. and many of our uh, uh, members of our party belong, uh, One DC and Power DC, that are organizing residents to get a better life. I happen to be on the steering committee of the Fair Budget Coalition. Mm -hmm. That organization has, and I've been a, a member for many years, and that organization mm -hmm. has been lobbying to get a fair budget to get a fair tax system. I would point out that uh, DC millionaires actually are paying a lower rate in DC taxes than all but the lowest income residents. And they have a huge tax base. That sounds like a Warren Buffett issue, doesn't it? Well, uh, mm -hmm. the good point, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and, and it isn't a matter of uh, uh, polarizing the community, it's a matter of a better life for everyone if we reduce income inequality. Mm -hmm. right. And that will empower our movement, I'm sure. And, and the key is, uh, you know, the slogan, statehood or else. What does that else mean? I think we need, first of all, um, a stronger mass movement, grassroots movement, to demand statehood and, and uh, embarrass our government, our federal government, for denying it, our Congress for denying us. And, and this would be uh, on a world scale. And I'm, I'm, by the way, I want to say that I'm very uh, impressed with the state of delegation, with Franklin Garcia and our two senators. They've done very good work lately, and uh, we applaud that.
Great. Now, on that note, I want to <laughs> thank you, David Schwartzman, for joining us today in the studio to talk about statehood and the and his involvement of more than 40 years with the D.C. Statehood Green Party. This has been uh, the segment of D.C. Statehood today. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to uh, join you joining us for future segments. Representation without It can be right for everyone else But wrong for you and me Everywhere in the USA Except Washington, D.C. We even go as far to fight for voting rights and democracy around the world and overlook our nation's capital. More than a century, we ain't been hurt. There's something wrong with taxation without its wrong. Let me hear you say taxation without how long, long, long we pay taxes, obey law like everyone else so tell me why can't we vote the only city in this nation without a voice and that's no joke for much too long we've been overlooked it's not fair for all that we do and expect us not to be discontent when the problem is really you, really you. Listen to the people cry. Taxation without somebody. Tell me why, tell me why. Once upon a time in a place not far away There were people paying taxes There was nothing they could say This went on and on for much too long to see But the straw that broke the camel's back A tax over the sea If you read your history They finally got the way And in case you didn't know This place, the USA So take this lesson from the past Cause it still ain't right Taxation without is the reason for this fight. Taxation without is wrong. Let me hear you say taxation without somebody. Tell me why, tell me why. Taxation without representation. Taxation without representation. Taxation without representation. Taxation without representation. Taxation without. Not a black or a white, but a wrong or right thing. Taxation without. Somebody tell me why, tell me why Taxation without It's wrong, wrong, wrong Taxation without Thank you for watching us. Remember you can watch us online at dctv.org or dc51.us and you can also follow us on Twitter at DC51 Today. I'm Denisha Richard and we hope to see you next time on DC Statehood Today.